Hello again, everyone. This is going to be the 11th week of our online organic chemistry lab. And this week we will be discussing uh, a technique called Fischer esterification of acetic acid by using isoamyl alcohol. Um, this is uh, based on, in the organic textbook, 30.2a. Uh, there's a little bit of variation uh, changing limiting agents using uh, Le Chatelier's principle to, to make things go quicker. Um, so for this one, make sure you read through the beginning of chapter 30 for you know quiz information and stuff like that. Uh, but the actual procedure itself is going to be based off of this presentation. So if there's any changes to that, always refer to this about the presentation. In this experiment, uh, we're going to be synthesizing isopentyl acetate. Um, technique is called Fischer esterification. It's a specific type of uh, way to create an ester using acid catalyst, stuff like that. Um, but isopentyl acetate is basically uh, an ester, so you're going to have a, a, car a carbonyl carbon double bond and then carbon oxygen single bond. So right next to each other, attach the same carbon. That's what makes it an ester. And the unique thing about esters are they have generally have very uh, strong smells associated with them. Um, and a lot of them have nice smells, smells that you get from fruits, um, sugars, syrups, stuff like that. That's generally some type of ester. And in this case, isopentyl acetate also is called banana oil because it's the main chemical that gives the banana its smell. Um, and if we actually we're doing this in lab you would know very very quickly once you started to produce it because it is very very pungent strong banana smell okay a little bit about uh, Fischer esterification uh, one of the main things especially with this reaction is it's an equilibrium reaction so uh, if you use exactly what you're supposed to use and everything goes greatly um, your product and reactants are going to be shifting back and forth you're going to make product and then it's going to reverse and make more reactant go back and forth constantly um, so uh, because this equilibrium is constantly going on it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the most amount of the ester the banana oil that we want the acetyl acetate so we're going to use something from gin kim that you hopefully remember called le chatelier's principle um, it's also known as the principle of mass action and we're going to use this to shift the equilibrium to the right in favor of the products we want so to do that, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to use the excess of one of our starting materials, which means we'll have tons of that starting material, so it'll be more prone to make more of your reactant and less prone to go back to the left, uh, sorry, to make more of your product, and then less prone to go back to the left to make more of your reactant because we have so much of it. It's, you know, the chemicals will see the presence of the, uh, the excess uh, reactant and it won't want to go back and make more. So what we're going to do is use acetic acid because it's much cheaper than the isopentyl, acid, uh, isopentyl alcohol. So that's going to be our excess. And what we're probably going to do is I think it's about threefold excess just to put so much in there to inundate the system that the equilibrium won't ever shift back to the left. Or if it does, it's just for a small, small amount. Um, also, we're going to be using sulfuric acid to acid catalyze this. And one good thing that a lot of the strong acids are, especially sulfuric, is they, they're very good at binding water around them, uh, mainly because you get the, the, uh, the protons come off. Your two different protons can come off fairly easily with sulfuric acid. And so you get a sulfate or a bisulfate counter ion, which can easily be complexed around, you know, anywhere from three to six waters can be complexed around it, depending on the environment and how much water you have. So that hydrogen, that the sulfuric acid is going to help bind water, which is being produced. And since it's being bound to the sulfuric acid, the basically when in the chemical environment, as you're making this isopentyl acetate, it's seeing, oh, there's not enough water. So it wants to make more water to keep everything happy. And while it's making more water, it's also making more isopentyl acetate. So the two key points are we're using excess acetic to try to stop the reaction from shifting back to the reactants. And we're using a very strong water binding acid catalyst, which basically will reduce the amount of water available in the system, 
which causes the system to try to make more water and make up for that. And while it's making more water, it's also making more isopentyl acetate. Now for the actual steps of synthesis, uh, this is an isolation procedure where basically we're, since it's an equilibrium reaction, we got a lot of stuff just constantly in different forms and solution. We need at some point to quench the reaction and then to isolate what we have to get our product. So um, especially uh, since we're using so much excess acetic acid, we need to be, find a way to get rid of that and then keep the remaining isopentyl acetate while also getting rid of any excess uh, isopentyl alcohol that has not reacted. So what we're going to do with this is use just a simple sodium bicarbonate and water extraction technique. Sodium bicarbonate is a uh, basically a, a buffered system that can take care of both acids and bases. So it, it'll pull out the excess acetic acid and since the isopentyl alcohol is fairly basic, it should neutralize most of that as well and pull that out in solution. And then, of course, water will help wash any extra molecules off as well as excess sodium bicarbonate. Um, and this will be done in a separation funnel, which will, I believe we've used once already this semester, but we'll talk about it again in a few slides. So after that's done, um, you will dry it again, because anytime you use water with organic chemicals, you always have to dry it to get the water out. And we're going to use sodium sulfate for this specific drying this time. Um, so mainly because we're using a strong sulfuric acid and we might have sulfate counter ions in there and they'll be more prone to complex with sodium in the in water systems. And uh, after you dry it, then you're going to distill your product, which at this point should just be the uh, isopentyl acetate. And you just distill it with a simple distillation apparatus, which we've done before, but we'll go over again. And then once that's done and you have your liquid product, you would normally at that point analyze it by IR. And we might, if time remains, we might talk about that a little bit. Mechanistically, this is actually a fairly complex mechanism. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of electrons and protons migrating around different resonant forms that are available at any specific given time, where only one of them will be the one in question that we're working with. So there's a lot going on. But uh, this is just the quickest, simplest way to look at it here. Um, I'm sure you can, looking online, you can find a, a whole proposed mechanism, and it's probably multiple pages long. There's a lot of stuff going on, but these are the key points you need to look at here. So uh, up on the top left, we start with our acetic acid, uh, and then it's in the presence of protons, which are going to be donated from the, uh, coming from the sulfuric acid, acid catalyst. So that proton is going to be, uh, attacked by the electrons, lone pairs of electrons in the carbonyl double bond oxygen there. And you start a resonance form here with this intermediate. Um, you're going to get both a double bond oxygen that's bound to hydrogen with a positive charge, which is on the top. And then that also is in resonance with the uh, carbocation on the bottom with the dual hydroxyl groups attached to it, the two hydroxyl groups. So both of those are in system. Both of those can be isolated and detected uh, through NMR and other techniques. But the one in question we want is the carbonyl, uh, not the carbonyl, sorry, the carbocation. Because of that carbocation, that of course is an electrophile, and we're using the isoamyl alcohol, and that's going to be our nucleophile. So when in the presence of the uh, isoamyl alcohol, the, the lone pair of electrons on the hydroxyl group in the alcohol will attack that uh, carbocation. And this is just a simple, you know, we've seen this before. Uh, in this case, that would be a, a planar carbocation that's technically a, what you would consider a tertiary, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, tertiary carbocation. So it, it would be a basically uh, almost like what we covered in the the nucleophilic substitution, um, where that would come in, and there might be a little bit of rearrangement, but it basically comes in and rearranges and attaches there. The oxygen from the alcohol attaches to that uh, carbocation. Um, now, now, going down to the center of the page, we see this intermediate molecule that has everything attached, uh, but because of the charge balances and electrons and everything, we still have a positive charge. That's, however, been shifted to the 
oxygen because we have three bonds to the oxygen now. We've got the, the initial uh, carbon chain from the alcohol. We've got the hydrogen from the hydroxyl group of the alcohol. And then, of course, we've got the linkage where it went on and attached to the carbocation. So, of course, you know, your oxygen is still like positive charges unless they can be resonant stabilized. So in this case, what happens is there's a bunch of electron transfer and proton abstraction that goes on. Basically, the, the proton on that positive charge, the hydrogen on the positive charged oxygen is going to drop off to help regenerate some of our acid catalyst. And then the you're going to have electron migration um, from that hydrogen is going to go through the system and kind of take itself to one of those hydroxyl groups that are off of that kind of central carbon there. And then that will also cause a positive charge and oxygen doesn't like that. So basically it's going to kick off as water. That's the key thing is once, once your alcohol attaches to the carbocation, there's a bunch of electron and proton transfers inner system in the same molecule that to, to basically isolate charges, to separate charges, and to make them more stable molecule. And basically the, the most important endpoint of this is that you're going to get rid of uh, at least one proton to help regenerate the acid catalyst, and you're going to kick off water. And that water is like what we were talking about earlier. That's the, the water that's generated that we're going to help bind with sulfuric acid so we can produce more product. So once that water's kicked off, um, you're only going to have one uh, hydroxyl group that's attached to that initial carbon there. Uh, but it is a positively charged because th there's just too many electrons around it, um, too many bonds going on. Um, so what happens is, of course, the, the uh, hydrogen that's attached to that oxygen is going to drop off again to help regenerate even more acid catalyst. Those electrons will then be associated solely with the oxygen, getting rid of that uh, positive charge, and everything will be nice and happy. And in the end, you end up with your isoamyl alcohol, I mean, sorry, your isopentyl acetate, and even more protons to help regenerate the catalyst, plus the initial water that was generated. And this whole thing, you know, basically every step in here is constantly going back and forth. Because if you look at everything, everything is there's there's weird structures in the intermediates, but they're all in resonance with each other, or they're just other other forms, other ways that things can be taken. The only true point where you start getting something new is the initial addition of your alcohol to your carbocation, and then the elimination of that water uh, molecule there near the end and when that water molecule is eliminated then you of course anytime you do eliminations you're going to be forming double bonds somewhere the double bonds form the oxygen doesn't like it because it's positively charged kicks off a hydrogen takes the electrons back and then makes your final product so this is a more you know this is a little bit more advanced uh process uh i estimate that uh when dr mighty makes the the quizzes for this that there might be some questions on some basic esterification, or fish, especially Fisher esterification, on how things go and you know what little steps you are. So I would definitely uh, brush up on it from the book. And if you don't have the book, if you never ended up getting it, then definitely go online and use online resources to look up uh, mechaniz mechanistically what can be learned from esterification, because there's going to be a lot of questions about it most likely. Touching a little bit on the Le Chatelier's principle that we're going to be using to kind of tailor our reaction. Uh, we have the basically uh, just drawn out stick figure reaction of what's going on. We've got our isoamyl alcohol plus acetic acid, and that's in equilibrium with the formation of the isopentyl acetate and water. So if you want to force the reaction to the right, you basically have to get a whole bunch of extra stuff on the left which causes more to be made on the right, or find a way to remove something on the right, which causes the left to see that stress and start making more when you take it away. So the best thing to do um, in terms of, you know, if you have everything set up and you know what you're doing, and if, like, for instance, this, this esterification, if you have a very volatile ester, something that, you know, has a very high uh, vapor pressure that can boil off really easily. You actually would do this like kind of in a one pot synthesis. And as your ester is being produced with a little bit of heat, you're adding the system, it would boil off and you can distill it while the reaction is going. 
And since you're removing your actual product while your extra is going, it's just going to keep making more and more of it until all of your reactants are used up. So that's what's that's, that's a really good way to do it. The problem with that is you have to have a very qualitative system and set up and, you know, constantly be tracking it and keeping track of it. And that's generally not very conducive to a learning lab or teaching lab. So, but in a, you know, an actual production lab, I'm pretty sure that's how they would do something like this. Get much higher yields overall. Um, what we're going to do is the alternative way, of course, is, is you're adding an excess of the cheapest starting material. Your cheapest uh, reactant, and for in the for this case, the acetic acid would be the cheapest, really, really cheap. And then in addition to that, um, so we're going to be adding more of, of one of the reactants to the left. So we're going to also, like I said earlier, is add uh, sulfuric acid as an acid catalyst, and that's going to help bind the water. And in terms of what's going on with the principle here, it's going to be removing water because you won't have water as a just a pure water molecule, it's going to be associated with the sulfate or the bisulfate ions as that acids, you know, donating protons and being reprotonated. So since it's bound, basically bound uh, around that molecule, it's not going to be available to be used as water normally would. So it's going to be, for all intents and purposes, removing water from the system. And that's going to cause more stress. The reactants are going to see, I'm not making enough water, so make more. And while you're making water, you're also making the isopentyl acetate. Now, for this reaction, the acetic acid is actually strong enough of an acid to start the whole thing in the presence of water. But we're using sulfuric acid to help bind the water. Uh, and what it does is an acid catalyst, is, since it's a stronger acid and can donate a whole lot more protons, orders of magnitudes more protons, it's going to basically make the reaction go faster. Uh, it's going to require less energy, less time for molecules to bump around each other and find those excess protons because there's going to be so many of them in the in the system. Um, it has very strong attraction for water. This helps uh, shift the reaction um, to the right, make more of our isopentyl acetate. Uh, you can see down there in the presence of water, you get the hydronium ion and the bisulfate ion there. Um, and actually, since it's such a strong acid, the H2SO4, the pK of that bisulfate ion, the HSO4 minus, is still fairly decent. It's it's not it's not too rough to take that extra proton off. So you might actually be able to take an extra proton off and have even more in solution. Um, that just depends on you know circumstances and if it's if it's available to be taken off. If, but uh, the water in H3O form and H2O itself can complex around that bisulfate pretty easily and be basically bound to it and take itself out of the whole system. Okay, some variations of what the textbook shows for the use of isoamyl alcohol. I believe the textbook shows butanol as the alcohol being used, um, and they use 0 .0, 0 0.03 moles of one butanol um, and 0 0.09 moles of glacial acetic acid, which is about a three, three times excess. So they, they also use the excess technique, but they're using butanol. We're going to be using the isoamyl, um, so we're still going to use the 0 0.03 moles to maintain that you know, 3 to 1 excess ratio. Uh, but for us, it's going to be the equivalent of 2.64 grams of isoamyl alcohol, which is density-based calculation. is 3.26 milliliters. Uh, we'll still use the 0 .00, 0 0.09 moles of glacial acetic acid, however, so that'll be the same. So as far as the textbook procedure, the procedure is pretty straightforward and it's the textbook is pretty much the same what we're going to do. Uh, the key point is, you know, we're using the isoamyl and differing amounts um, specified here. So that's a, a big thing. So you will probably be asked, you know, some type of question on the quiz or something like that. You know, which 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 alcohol are we using? And I can guarantee both isoamyl and butanol will be on there. So, you know, make sure it's you remember it's the isoamyl that we're changing up for this reaction. Okay, actual procedure-wide, procedure-wise, sorry, uh, we're doing something called a reflux for the beginning of this. And what a reflux does is basically, it's, think of it like cooking. Anytime you're cooking something and, you know, the directions for something to be cooked says, you know, after you bring it to boil, return to low heat and let it simmer for, you know, 20, 30 minutes or whatever, something, something along those lines. Basically what that is, is that's called a reflux. That's the actual technical term for it. And what you're doing in a reflux is you're 
very gently boiling your uh, solution in question to add extra heat to it. And what this does is, of course, it's adding heat, so it's increasing the internal energy of the system, causing things to bump into more things more often, causing the reaction to go faster, stuff like that. But you're getting some stuff that's evaporating while, while you're doing this because you are boiling, so stuff's evaporating. So what's happening is your, your least uh, – your most volatile substances, the things with the highest vapor pressure, in this case, that's going to be stuff like your isopentyl estate, your esters, because esters generally have it. They have a strong smell, so they have a high vapor pressure. That's just a one-to-one -one ratio. The stronger you, the easier you can smell it, the higher the vapor pressure is. So that's actually going to start evaporating and boiling off. So as that boils off, it goes up into a condenser, a water condenser, cools down, comes back down. So what that's actually doing is it's removing, technically, for a short period of time, it's removing that isopentyl acetate from the system, making Le Chatelier's principle cause again and make more of it. And then it condenses and slowly drips down um, and starts to heat back up and goes over and over again. So what reflux is doing is, is number one, it's adding more energy to the system to make the reaction go faster. And number two... It's removing either some of your solvent, which we don't – we're not really worried about a solvent too much in this one. Everything's a liquid. So uh, it either removes some solvent to make the reaction go faster or it removes some of your product that you're looking for to make the reaction go faster using Le Chatelier's principles. So that's what we're going to do here because normally if you were just you know letting this – shaking it or stirring it and putting it in a, in a, a reaction vessel and letting it do its on its own – it would probably take hours to, to get to a point where you would have enough isopentyl acetate. So this speeds up things quite a bit. So uh, the way this is all set up, you got your heating mantle, and of course heating mantles are always going to be clamped with a ring on a ring stand so you can drop it in case of flash boils and stuff like that. But uh, inside of that uh, heating mantle, you can have a 25 milliliter round bottom flask. And in this specific order, because we don't want anything, you know, messing it up with the reaction or starting too early, you want to add your initial uh, isoamyl alcohol, the uh, 3.27 milliliters of isoamyl, into the round bottom flask. Uh, then you want to add, uh, works out to 5.1 milliliters of glacial acetic acid. That's in three times excess, so the 0 0.09 moles instead of the 0 0.03. Uh, then you add 0.4 mil of concentrated sulfuric acid. Always be careful with that. It's very syrupy, strong acid. It's going to be hitting the water, so there's going to be extra heat. It might splash around a little bit. And then you're going to add you know, two to three boiling chips to help everything stay nice and easy, have nucleation sites and not bump around and splash around while it's boiling. So once that's all set up, then you're going to add a West, it's called a West condenser or distillation condenser. It's, it's thin. It's not as thick as a distillation system um, because you basically you want the, the vapor to cool as quickly as possible and drip back down into the, in the system. Uh, whereas distillation, you want to make the, the the vapor stay in an area, cool slowly, and then leave completely as liquid. So this is a little bit different. It's vertical in this case instead of you know the horizontal down angle like a distillation normally is. And always remember when you use that west condenser, the water inlet is in the bottom, the outlet is at the top. Otherwise, the water just cascades down and falls out due to gravity, never stays long enough to cool the system down. So you always want water in at the bottom, out at the top. Um, once all that's set up and clamped, remember to use silicon grease on your gas, on any of your glass connections, because you don't want them to, to, to shock heat, expand, and not be able to come out and be stuck forever. So you always do a little bit of silicon grease. Um, and once that's all set up and clamped and good to go, you're going to heat this to a, a light boil and keep it at that temperature, light boiling, for one hour. So it's if you do this in the, in the lab, you know, it would take a little bit longer than your normal lab, probably the whole, you know, almost three hours for setup and this and the distillation at the end. So, uh, again, remember we're using glacial acetic, and, and anytime you see glacial with acetic acid, that just means basically as pure, as easily obtainable is what glacial means. It's an old term. But it ends up being like 80, I think 84% glacial, 84% acetic acid, uh, the rest just being water that is just takes way too long and too much work and energy to distill it out so it's it's very strong even though you know acetic acid is always yeah it's it's basically vinegar you remember vinegar of course you can get it on your hands you drink it you know it's 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 in a lot of foods dressings and stuff like that but vinegar is only 10 percent acetic acid so this is 
at least eight times stronger. And at that point, it's actually it's not a strong acid; it's still a weak acid, but it can. It's organic acid. It's a small molecule, so it can very easily get into your skin and cause burns. So you would have to watch out for that. And then, of course, anytime you work with any type of of uh, sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid, that's that's bad stuff. So that's a thing to watch out with that. All right, and some tips. Uh, anytime you're using small liquid measurements, it's always hard to get very accurate with small amounts because you always get some of the liquid that sticks inside of either graduated cylinders or, or measuring apparatus. Um, you know, one drop when you're when you're doing small amounts, one drop is quite a bit. So the the easiest thing to do with stuff like this is when you're measuring stuff out. It's actually probably easier to use the round bottom flask as just the vessel for everything and weigh it as is and then tear the system and uh, the, the scales and then drop it in and weigh it, do everything by weight instead of actual volume because the scales can go to four decimal points in terms of, of grams so you can get down to you know less than a milligram so that's that's a large difference in uh, measurement whereas it's really hard to eyeball that you know half or less than half of a milliliter in a graduated cylinder or something along those lines so um, and then when you're measuring sulfuric acid, for instance, for this specific one, you need 0.4 milliliters. And, you know, even using the smallest uh, graduated cylinder, if you don't have an auto pipette or something where you can dial it in, you know, the, the easiest thing to remember is just as a quick eyeball type situation, a standard drop of liquid, like if you pull it up in a pipette and just do one little drop, let it slowly drop out, that's about 0.05 milliliters. So, you know, eight eight seven or eight drops like that normal size drops would be basically 0.4 milliliters so that's that's a way you can do stuff like that as well it's just some basically easy little tips okay after you're done with the one hour reflux uh you're gonna drop the heating mantle turn the heat off uh, turn the water off disconnect all your your equipment you won't be using that west condenser anymore um and you're going to put your round bottom flask inside of an ice bath and you're going to let it cool down. Basically what this is going to do is to remove as much of that uh, excess heat going on and slow the reaction down. It's an equilibrium reaction, so it's constantly going to be trying to make more products and reactants to go back and forth, even with our you know, little excess tricks and binding the water tricks. But if we cool it down, um, that just inherently slows the molecular motion down removes energy from the system so there's less of a chance for stuff to be going on all right once your uh, reaction vessel and the liquids inside are nice and cool been in an ice bath probably at least you know five maybe ten minutes uh, we're gonna start the isolation process we want to isolate our isopentyl acetate and we want to do it fairly quick because like I said e even though we've cooled it down quite a bit uh, we're going to start shaking it. That adds energy. It's going to start getting back to room temperature. That's added up more energy, and this it's going to keep trying to make more products and reactants because it's a equilibrium reaction. So um, the first thing we're going to do is decant our liquid solution out of your round bottom flask, being sure to leave those uh, boiling chips inside the round bottom flask. You don't ever want those in the separatory funnel. They get stuck in the little uh, – stop cock at the bottom but decant the liquid out into a separatory funnel um, it's a little it's a bulb a conical funnel with a big bulb on top and a stopper that you could open and close um, on the bottom of stop cock is what it's called um, to let liquid come out but you're going to decant it into the separatory funnel and in that separatory funnel you're going to need five milliliters of uh, water and once you've decanted the liquid you're going to close the top of your separatory funnel and basically do a gentle shaking. Uh, don't go crazy with it because if you do sh shake it up, we, we are working with organic molecules and organics and water generally don't mix, but we're working with esters and alcohols and acids and those do mix with water. So even though you do have different density levels and there are organics in there, a lot of this stuff can mix together. So if you shake it too vigorously, you get what's called an emulsion. And it forces the molecules together. You'll start seeing bubbles and it'll get foamy. So you just kind of want to do a, a gentle swirling to make sure the water's getting through there. And what this is doing is it's basically pulling off um, your, your 
any excess acetic acid that you've got, uh, any excess unreacted uh, isoamyl alcohol. It's it's pulling it away from basically everything else and, and separating things. Um, once, you, once you shake it up for a few minutes, probably, you know, five minutes at the most gentle shaking, uh, you're going to put it in a ring stand, let it, let it slowly separate via gravity, and you're going to allow the aqueous and the organic layers to separate. So any of your, any of your, you know, acids or any charged molecules will be pulled out through that water layer and you'll just have organics at the top. Now, once that water layer has fully separated and it's been sitting there for a few minutes, you're going to drain off the, the lower water layer. It's going to be heavier than your organics. Um, drain that off. It's just going to be a waste. You can throw it in the waste container, the aqueous waste container. And all you'll have left is the top organic layer. Um, and at this point, we want to fully uh, neutralize any excess uh, acetic acid or base that hadn't been washed out with the uh, water wash. And to do this, you're going to, to that separatory funnel, you're going to add 5 milliliters of a saturated sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate solution. Uh, this would already have been made for you, so it's just getting measuring out 5 milliliters and pouring it in there. And this will neutralize uh, easily because it's way in excess of anything we have in there, uh, any of your acids or bases that are in there. Um, and same, same thing. You swirl it for several minutes. But because sodium carbonate solution, it's water. It's basically salt in, in water. So it's five milliliters of water with some salt in it. A lot of salt, but still it's water. Same thing, a gentle swirling. Don't shake it up too much. Don't let it emulsify. After you've shaken it for a few minutes, um, allow it to separate again into layers. And you got to be careful with this one because you're forming carbon dioxide gas as these things neutralize. So there's a lot of pressure building up. And anytime you work with a separatory funnel, there's a little, little glass stopper on top of it. Every few seconds of swirling it, you have to open that top stopper and let the gas vent out because that gas can build up to dangerous levels inside. Um, and even if it doesn't get dangerous where there's explosive hazards, uh, it can actually expel that top stopper and shoot liquid out uh, due to pressure differentials. So it's always, you know, every 30, basically every 30 seconds at most when you're doing separatory funnel work to isolate things or separate things or extract things, always vent that top stopper because if you don't, you know, you'll end up losing everything all over your fume hood, if not breaking glass. So once it's, uh, once, once again, you swirl for a few minutes, venting the carbon dioxide, you again set it in the ring stand, let it sit there and let the two layers fully separate again. Uh, at this point, the aqueous flavor will, will have, uh, have any excess sodium bicarbonate solution. Uh, all of the neutralized acid and base should be pulled out through there as well. Um, as well, since we're using a, a ions again, ionic sodium uh, bicarbonate solution, it's also going to pull a little bit of water that might be abound from your initial thing in there as well. So uh, once that's done, then the layers are separated. Then remove that lower aqueous layer again, and hopefully we'll just have neutralized, cleaned uh, organic layer in the separatory funnel. Once we have the water washed and then sodium bicarbonate neutralized system that's left in your separatory funnel, you want to take that and decant it out of the separatory funnel into a flask that has your anhydrous sulfate salt. It's either going to be a sodium or a magnesium sulfate based on what they have in the lab. Um, and this basically complexes water. It does an even better job of your than the sulfuric acid does, but it, it hard binds, complexes water uh, to an octahedral compound, so every every molecule of magnesium sulfate or or sodium sulfate will take six molecules of water, and it's basically it's just going to leach all the water out of that that uh, that that might have been left in the organic layer. So once you pour that in there to your magnesium sulfate, you're really only going to add you know a couple pinchfuls because um, it does a really good job of working. You're going to do a couple, little bit of swirling, allow it to settle and then take a look at it. And what you're looking for is um, when you initially pour, the, pour it in there, it's going to start clumping up. And if it all clumps up into big clumps, that means you know it's doing a really good job pulling water out, but there might still be some more water in there. So you just keep adding a tiny pinch at a time and swirling it and, and letting it go until it looks like there's white sand at the bottom. And if, if you see it's you know tiny grains, that means there's no more water to take out of it. So you just let that sit for a couple more minutes and settle until there's just white grains and not big clumps. 
And then at that point, you take another Rhyme Bottom Flask, you can do the same one as long as you've cleaned it out and washed it and dried it. Um, and you put a funnel with some filter paper in it, and then you're going to filter out the the sulfate salt and just keep the liquid, your organic, your isopentyl acetate, hopefully. With, with, it'll have some excess stuff in it, but mainly isopentyl acetate. And in this case, we're not using vacuum filtration because vacuum filtration is used when you want to keep the solid, and we want the solid is the sulfate salt in this case. We want to get rid of it. It's just, you know, binding the water. So we use gravity filtration, just a standard funnel um, and some filter paper, and just let it fully gravity filter the liquid through that filter paper and just keep the liquid. Make sure there's no solid in your round bottom flask. One thing you can do to minimize losses, because we are, like I said, we are working with small amounts of liquids, um, you can use a pentane compound. Um, we use pentane because we're using uh, isopentyl acetate. So pentane is a good solvent for mimicking the way isopentyl acetate kind of looks, and they can you know stick together. So you can rinse your, your beaker that has the magnesium sulfate in there, you can rinse it with a couple milliliters of pentane, swirl it, allow it to settle again, and then uh, decant that into the filter again after you've done your initial. What this does is any of your excess organics that might be trapped in the magnesium sulfate, because the pentane is fairly similar structurally to the isopentyl acetate, um, it pulls that out as well, so you can get a higher yield. And the pentane has a different boiling point, so when you do the distillation at the very end, you won't get that mixed in with your isopentyl acetate. All right, now that your products have all been washed and neutralized and, you know, dried with sulfate salts and maybe extracted with a little bit of pentane to get as much out of there as possible, you're going to do a simple, fairly short path distillation um, in that same round bottom flask. So you would drop a couple more boiling chips in that round bottom flask. Um, the thing to see here is, like I talked about in the earlier slide, Pentane is going to boil off at 36 Celsius, while isoamyl acetate is 142 Celsius. So that's a huge difference. So that's the, the very, very easy thing to do is when you set this up, you have the, the heating element again on a heating mantle on a ring stand so you can drop it. Uh, you round bottom flask with some boiling chips and your solution that contains your isoamyl acetate and your pentane, if you use it, anything else in there. Uh, you're just going to have the little... Uh, thermometer head with the condenser outlet there and uh, distillation condenser with the water in and out valves and it's just going to you know boil off and the vapor is going to go down the condenser get hit with the cool water and condense and slowly drip out and since we are working with such small amounts the best way to do it is just use test tubes uh, get the weight of them because it's easier to measure weight than it is volume again um, and so you would crank up the temperature and, and watch, keep the temperature, you know, 36, so right around there, maybe a couple degrees over, and just keep it steady at that until you stop seeing liquid coming out. And what that does is just that boils off all your pentane. pentane. Um, and since it's a different boiling point, your isoamyl acetate won't be taken out with it. It'll just be pure pentane. And then once it's not dripping any more of that out, then you can take that uh, test tube, set it aside. It's just going to be waste in the uh, organic waste container and then you can crank the temperature up again get it to 142 and boil off the isoamyl acetate um, and collect as much of that as you can in another pre-weighted test tube um, until you stop seeing again you stop seeing the uh, anything dripping out um, because this is a volatile system um, it's not very flammable but anytime you have a highly volatile uh, product you're working with never fully uh, heat the round bottom flasks to complete dryness. You don't want it to be completely dry. You always want it to be a little sheen of liquid in there. Not like a, a, a pool of liquid, but you want to be able to see a little bit of liquid. It just stops, you know, pressure and flammability issues to go. Always, so always, when you're working with volatile stuff, never distill it to dryness. So you'll have your two test tubes. One is the waste. The first fraction will be pentane. Your second one will hopefully be just pure isoamyl acetate. All right, at that point, you've got your little test tube with isopentyl acetate. You just measure it again and figure out how much you weight of your iso, 
uh, pentelacidate you have, change it from density back to milliliters, and you can determine your percent yield. Um, if time was uh, not a factor in the lab, we would have groups of people come up and check with the IR to look at your functional groups. The, uh, you see carbonyl, you see the ester group very well. You can see the, the, the isopentyl structures with the carbon hydrogen bonds very well. So it's really easy to see a specific molecule using IR. Um, and just a quick cleanup and all of that. So fairly simple lab. Uh, the mechanism, again, is a sticking point, uh, generally for most people in non-major organic mechanisms are always one of the harder things to look at. So I would definitely use any resource you had, including outside resources, to look over that mechanism and, you know, be prepared for your, your quiz on this. Um, so we did Fischer esterification with an acid catalyst. Remember, it's an equilibrium reaction, so it's constantly shifting. So we used excess of a, a reactant to keep it going to the right, and we used a chemical that bound water to keep it going back to the left. Um, we also did a reflux to help out a little bit there to make it go quicker. Um, even though it took an hour, it would have taken much longer without that added heat. Uh, and then after that, we extracted the isyl, uh, pentyl alcohol, isopentyl acetate using separatory techniques of water washing and sodium bicarbonate wash and pulled it out of the uh, solution with pentane and then did a distillation to remove the pentane and just the pure isopentyl acetate banana oil. All right, I hope this one wasn't too rough for you. Uh, not very much left in the semester. I believe there are a total of 14 labs, if I remember. So there's going to be probably three. This was the 10th lab, not including the uh, safety lecture. So this is the 11th week. So I, I would assume there's probably three more labs. Um, so that your last lab will either be that short week of Thanksgiving or maybe that week after that that first that you know the last part of November and the first part of December and I think that's it uh, you might want to just check the syllabus online on Blackboard just to be sure 100 percent but hope everything went well for you and I will see you again next week